we will be spending a lot of time looking at chemical abstracts. So it is very important to see what the editors of chemical abstracts do when they have an article. I am just using this sample journal article. I could have taken any journal article. I could have taken a patent. I just chose this one because it was produced by somebody who worked at City College, and it's a kind of interdisciplinary article. This is just part of the first page of this 2006 article. Notice that they list the addresses of all the authors who contributed to this paper. Many papers these days are written by people at different institutions. The remaining slides are what this record looks like in the Chemical Abstracts database. Those two numbers at the top are a way to just identify when this particular article was put into the database. Each article has its own unique number. Chemical Abstracts list the title exactly as they find it in the original paper. They list all the authors exactly as they are listed in the original paper. Note what I put in red. They only list one address. Even though the original paper had these people working at different addresses and it listed all their addresses, they only list one. This is one place where the Web of Science, Science Citation Index is a little stronger. They do list all the addresses. They list the source, the name of the journal, and the standard way of citing a journal article. They also list the ISSN number for this journal, which is the International Standard Serial Number. The CODEN, as I said before, is hardly ever used these days. You don't have to pay attention to it. They list what type of document this is and what language it is, because in the database, as we will see, if you want to, you can just search for journal articles and you can search articles by their language. The classification at the bottom of the screen is not important these days. That's where the article appeared in the printed chemical abstracts. Since, nine, since 2009, there have been no print editions. So it is only useful for people who are consulting the print and want to scan different se sections of it. After the basic identification of this article, Chemical Abstracts includes their own abstract. I say their own abstract because they often rewrite the abstract that is in the original paper. This information so far, the identification of this journal article and the abstract are available in many databases like Google Scholar. So why do we need chemical abstracts? That's what the following slides will show. I always tell students that if you have trouble sleeping at night, open up this record, take a good look at it, and get to know every little detail because it's so important in understanding how to use and search chemical abstracts. What the people at Chemical Abstracts do is go far beyond what's in the title and in the abstract. They read the paper and bring out every important concept and every important substance that's mentioned in the paper. Let's look at the concepts first. They describe the subjects in a very standardized way. These standardized terms are called controlled terms. It's a consistent way of looking at subjects. The point is when you are searching chemical abstracts and you're searching by subject, you need to know what the standardized consistent way of searching by subject is. We'll see how to do that in the next lesson. Again, as I point out, the standardized subjects are in blue. What's in parentheses under each one of the, these blue entries is language from the original paper. 
that the editors of Chemical Abstracts has, have put in. The last slide showed how subjects are entered into the Chemical Abstracts database. This slide and the next one shows you how Chemical Abstracts handles substances. When Chemical Abstracts published printed indexes, it was very easy to see the difference between subject and chemical substances. There are two distinct different printed indexes. Just like subjects had a consistent controlled term way of searching for them, the same thing for chemical substances. Chemical Abstracts uses registry numbers. Once a registry number is assigned to a substance, that same registry number will always be assigned to that substance, and that will always be the way to search for it. You can see from this sample record that for some of the substances, and only for some of them, they also have a common name for that substance. So for a few of these substances, you can search on their common name. Most of the substances just have their registry number, which means when you are searching chemical abstracts in whatever version, whether it's on STN or in SciFinder, you need to get the registry number in the system and searchable. Just like with the subjects, you saw the standardized subject and the information in parentheses underneath it are phrases from the original paper. The same thing with chemical substances. They list a chemical substance and what's associated with that substance, what's studied about it, in parentheses right underneath it. These records for the chemical substances can be very long, and this particular one is continued on the next slide. Some records are even longer than this one. This is a continuation of the previous slide. They list all the substances in that paper. The P after the registry number means that substance was prepared in this study. At the end of each record in chemical abstracts, whether you are looking at it on STN or in SciFinder, you will see this paragraph of supplementary terms. As I indicate here, these terms are not standardized, they're not controlled terms. I already talked about how important it is to search for subjects by their standardized term. So why do these supplementary terms even exist? Why are they part of the record? This goes back to the time when Chemical Abstracts was published in print there would be a weekly printed issue of each chemical abstracts, and every six months, a new volume would conclude. At the end of each volume, a few months later, there would be an index published for that volume. Chemists did not want to wait several months to be able to view the literature. So each weekly issue had the supplementary terms which is a way to quickly get at each article. It was a lot easier for the editors to temporarily assign these terms than to complete the full record. For several years, this supplementary term in index was published in very bright pink paper, which people were able to tear out when they bound the chemical abstracts after the six months was over. Because once the six month volume indexes came out, you did not need these supplementary terms any longer. There was a big dispute as to whether these supplementary terms should be even included in the database. They decided in the end to include them. Because even though this is a non-standard way of looking at subjects, it's a supplementary way that could help you. Again, you always base any search on first 
finding the standardized way of searching for that subject or searching for the registry number for chemical substances. This is just an additional aid.